Right, everybody. Today, um, obviously, everybody always talks about agents. Um, we've got Paul Mitchell here from Sierra and Paul's going to tell us how agents operate, how they start, what sort of qualifications they need, and basically everything about being an agent. Paul, welcome. Thank you very much for the time. Morning, Dashi. And uh, yeah, as we say, I've got to start with this question. There is a myth that agents are not exactly upright. Yeah, I think uh, th there's, there's good and bad in every walk of life and in every business. Um, you know, agents are regulated, even after the, the change in the rules of 2015. Around the world, agents are regulated uh, and are supposed to be regulated. The difference being now from 2015 is that before 2015, it was, it was regulated by FIFA, which it still is. It's just that what happens now is it's been pushed back to the associations. So football associations within every different country within the world have to be responsible for policing their own agent or intermediaries, as we're now called, system. So you're always going to get good, you're always going to get bad, but the key to having uh, ethical and professional agents or intermediaries working within any country is the regulation that's put out there by the FAs. If it's regulated properly by the FAs, then there shouldn't be any uh, malpractice. Just looking at it worldwide, Paul, um, I would imagine when FIFA controlled it, it was, it was run a lot better than it is by the local association? It was to a degree. Um, what were the fundamental or what are the fundamental differences before you had to take an exam to become an agent? The exam was, was very difficult, um, even for people or some people that knew the rules inside out were failing the exam. Um, what the exam also encouraged in parts of the world was corruption because in some, F some FAs around the world people were obtaining licenses a corrupt, a corrupt way. The other difference is there's that um, any, any disputes regarding agents and players etc or agents and clubs was in the main handled by FIFA. So if there was a problem with an agent or an agent had a problem with a player or vice versa that generally would be heard by, by FIFA, whereas now it's heard by the association. Uh, and as I said previously, if associations like England, like France, like Germany, where they have proper systems in place that are managed correctly, there shouldn't be any issues. It's where you've got countries that still don't have, or maybe they still don't have a practice in place, that you're going to come up against issues. Let me just say, um as a personal opinion, it must be extremely difficult doing business that way in South Africa, <laughs> having grown up in, in um, the way football's played here, done here. Um, so I would, I would just add that. Just, a, just talking about South, South Africa per se, um, we've got rules and we haven't got rules. What I mean by that is, until now, from 2015, SAFA have still not put in place an, interme an intermediary system. So, for example, myself being from the UK, I'm actually registered as a licensed intermediary in the UK under the English Football Association. They've got a system in place like the rest of the world, France, etc. Unfortunately, I don't know why, but in South Africa, there's no system in place. So, effectively, there's no registered licensed intermediary within South Africa. The only thing I'll say that is in place to a degree is that when you negotiate a deal within South Africa, some clubs, but not all, do follow the practice. And the practice is, is that you, you sign an intermediary declaration form and there's certain paperwork that a club and an agent have to follow, which is obviously submitted to SAFA as part of that deal. However, that's not happening at all the clubs and unfortunately if you've not got a system in place from the association you can't expect um, clubs or intermediaries to follow it so whilst we have got licensed intermediaries like myself operating in South Africa 
majority are registered with different associations, like I say, myself being, being a UK. And my, my UK intermediary license allows me to operate worldwide in a bona fide and a legal way. Do you think I'd make a good agent? No, Deshi. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I've got to ask you, um, what sort of qualifications do you need? Um, some people are under the impression you need a law degree or you work with an attorney. Um, and then also, from start to finish, when you see a player, how does that process work? Look, in terms of qualifications, because there's no exam now from FIFA, it's the, that was the, uh, the uh, in the olden days, that was the, the kind of qualification you actually needed to become a licensed agent. Now you don't need that. Personally, my story was I was in, entered into management from the age of 17 and I spent 13 years in logistics management uh, working up to a very senior level, uh, working both in the UK and Europe and into Asia. I then went into sports management and people often ask me, how did you go from logistics management into sports management? Well, the answer is, is that I, I played football at a decent level when I was young. Um, I was involved in the agency side of, of football from an early age, because one of my best friends was a professional footballer in the UK before the days of agents. Tell us who? Mark Rankin, who is now one of the leading sports agents in the UK. Um, when Mark was playing football in the early 90s, uh, there was no agents in them days. Um, and I used to assist him in certain areas, so I got a good understanding of how the business worked. But being in management from a very early age, you know, as I always say, management is management. It doesn't matter if you're managing the careers of a football footballer and negotiating in terms of that, or like I did previously, where I was managing shifts of people up to 600 people at a time and managing supervisors and um, different aspects of, of, of a workforce. Um, I'm qualified in management. I've studied management all my life, done various courses in management. Um, what I've done in football is I've studied uh, in sports management, um, done courses in sports management. And in terms of contract negotiation, I had a lot of experience in terms of contract negotiation, business development in my last roles in my logistics career, and I just transferred that into football. The only thing I would say is that when I transferred from logistics management into sports management, I started at the bottom of sports management, whereas at 27, 28, 30, I was very senior in logistics. And I think in my last job, I had 600 staff. So going into football and going into sports management, I started from the bottom and I've worked to where I am today. So I come to you as a young player. Um, I ask you to look after my interests. How long does that process take? until you find me a club, sign, give me sign, and uh, uh, what sort of money are we talking about? Look, it's, uh, that question is quite difficult because the way that we operate is we, we generally do our own scouting. So in terms of talent identification, um, which I'm, I'm qualified in talent identification in terms of the English FA level one, doing my level two now. Um, in terms of talent identification, we do all of that ourselves. So within Sea of Uma Sports per se, uh, Africa, we have personnel in Johannesburg, in Cape Town, in Tanzania, in Senegal, uh, in Namibia. So we, we're actively scouting across, the, across the, the region. We identify talent for ourselves. And if we're talking about South Africa per se, just for the audience to, to get a, a grasp of how we do things is that you know, you'll see myself or members of Siavuma scouting at junior tournaments, scouting in the junior leagues, and we scout from um, as low as under 13 level. Because what I've found over the years of working, especially from South Africa, is the younger we get a young player, the better. Why? Is because we then grow with that player through his journey. We take him from under 13 level. We work with him all the way through. And if you take somebody like a, a Reef Rosler that we started working with when Reef was 14, we've gone on his journey to where he is at Kaiser Chiefs now as number one right back, national team player at the age of 21, 
uh, and now looking for the horizons of Europe. But we've been on that journey with Reef and we've been able to grow together our relationship and using our experience, making sure that the boys stay on the, on the straight and narrow. Um, just going back to your original question, if somebody approaches us, uh, we don't just sign any, anybody. So it all depends on where the player's at, what's his age, where is he currently playing, what qualities does he have, and we'll go through a process of determining is, is he a player that would fit our brand and would fit what we're about? Um, because we also, as many people know, have a, a joint venture with Base Soccer in London. Um, so the way we do things has to mirror the way that Base Soccer in London do things within their brand as well. So when we are taking on a new client, there's, there's a lot of criteria that we have, to, we have to fit as a company. And it's not a, a, a case of anybody signing for, for SSG. Is there, a Paul, some of the deals you've done that stand out? And um, has there been some difficult situations with uh, clubs? Most definitely, and I think definitely out of South Africa, um, it's very difficult to do a deal to Europe with a player because generally um, clubs are putting in a lot of money into young players and into players. We have a league that if you compare it to the rest of Af Africa, I would say apart from Egypt, you know, our league is at the top in Africa. Um, players are paid quite well in line with, you know, sort of smaller leagues around Europe. Um, so there's a lot of dynamics that go into it. Um, look, as a company, since I came to South Africa in 2009, we've been at the forefront of taking, you know, good young talent into, into Europe. So if you look at Sianda Kulu, we took at 20 to Russia. Uh, Robin and Galandi, we took to Atletico Madrid at 18. Keegan Dolly, obviously, to Montpellier. Gif Links now to Denmark. So we've been at the forefront of that. Um, we brokered Pakamani Malambi to Al Ali. Um, so we've been at the forefront of taking players to Europe. Again, going back to your original question, I think, you know, the difficult ones, I suppose everybody knows about the Keegan Dolly uh, situation, which was difficult, but we came to a common ground with Sundowns and, 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 and in the end, Sundowns allowed Keegan to leave. Uh, Sianda Kulu was no different. And that's mainly because at the end of the day, you know, a club like Sundowns doesn't really want to lose the best players. But at the same time, they do understand that, you know, all players in Africa and especially in South Africa, if they get the chance to get to Europe, that's where they want to be. And also for the development of South African football, you know, we shouldn't be sitting at 83 in the world or 75 in the world or whatever it should be. We should be sitting in the top two or three in Africa and we should be sitting in the top 50 in the, in the, in the FIFA world ranking. So, why you know, you, we, we, why, need to, we need why, to get there. Why do you think that's the case? I, I think again... Basically from 96 we've gone all the way down. I think, look, I think there's a lot of dynamics that go into it. I think, obviously, the strength of the PSL as a commercial entity, as a commercial league, makes it more difficult for players to leave because, you know, at the end of the day, our players are playing in good league, in a good league. Um, in the majority, the, they earn quite good money. Um, so clubs are investing. Um, I think our transfer fees are on the heavy side. Um, I think the problem we have in the PSL, whether it's from clubs or from the public, is that we automatically think that on a Saturday afternoon, the scout in Montpellier or the scout in Marseille or the scout in Holland, Germany, France and England switches on his telly and watches the PSL. The reality, it doesn't. The reality is that South Africa per se, unless we're in a World Cup, unless we're in an AFCON, unless we're in the junior finals like a World Cup and an AFCON at junior level or the Olympics, um, you know, the, the eyes are not on South Africa, really. It, be, it becomes the job of an agency like ourselves to market players for Europe. And I don't think the, the Joe public understand the work that goes in to market a player like a, a Gif Links who's just gone to Denmark for 
you know, very good money in terms of a transfer fee. But the work that goes into that from our side, I don't think people quite understand. I think people think automatically all eyes are on South Africa and it's not. Getting back to your question of why are we not up there in the top 50? I think it's the, the dynamics and I think it's, it's a similar argument to say with the infrastructure that we have in terms of South Africa as a country. Why is the economy not better? Why is the country not doing better? And I think it's the same dynamics that are in football is that, you know, the history of the country has taken a long time for the different dynamics to come together. Um, and I think you were always going to have a bit of a setback pre-94 until the, in terms of football, until the dynamics came together properly. Um, I, think, I think we're producing better players now from a younger perspective than we do it, than we're doing 10 years ago. Um, I think the level of football in the PSL has slipped slightly and I think there's reasons for that but as a product it's fantastic and as I always say all credit to Dr. Ivan, Dr. Ivan Corza and uh, the people that sit on the, the NEC board of the PSL for producing a product like it, like it has and all credit for you know, the way that clubs um, have to run and the legislation and the, and the rules that go into that. But there's still room for improvement. And I think as we keep improving and we keep developing, the key is to getting more people, more young players and more players overseas. The more we get overseas, we'll see the ranking go up. The key to getting players overseas is the real, realism on transfer fees. If you look at a country like Chile, smaller country than South Africa, even Uruguay, smaller country. But what they do is they, they let players go young, smaller transfer fees, but retain higher percentages of players. So instead of going for a million euro and 10% sell on, they might let a player go for half a million euro and retain 30 or 35%. Because what they do is they don't look at that first move, they look at the second move. And I think that's why them smaller countries have been successful. And I think that's a model that we also need to consider in South Africa. But I tell you what, that uh, makes serious sense. But you mentioned transfer fees, like gift links and all that. What sort of transfer fees are South African clubs charged? Look, depending on the level of a player, but in, re in realistic terms now, any player going to Europe at a decent level, our clubs are looking for, I would say, a minimum six, seven, eight hundred thousand euros as a minimum. You know, and you've had players going from that level right through to the players of, of Percy that went for three million pounds, Keegan that went for two million euro. Um, so, yeah, I think and then it obviously depends on the age of a player, you know, uh, potential of a player. But in general, if you wanted me to give you a base figure, I would say anywhere from six, seven hundred thousand euros upwards is the asking price. Paul, there's also, or people believe that uh, when you take players on, you, we could e either use the word nurture or baby them. Is that the case? Do you really have to look? Look, it's them? very, it's yeah, it's very difficult. People don't realise what goes into the management of of a player, and you know, management of people is one of the hardest things to manage. Uh, management, uh, managing change is one of the biggest things to, to manage. So if we take somebody from the shores of South Africa, a young player to Europe, managing that process, managing that change in his whole environment is very difficult. You know, managing, he's going from a climate like South Africa maybe into a climate in, in Europe where it's completely different. The food's different, the training different, the level of football's different. You know, all them different things are different. They're away from home. They haven't got family around them, friends around them. You know, people say South African players are not as tough as the rest of Africa. And, and to be honest, uh, I agree with that. But then you've got to look at what do we have in South Africa? We have everything like Europe. So it's very difficult to leave here, go there. And then, yes, you would think they would adapt quicker. But because South Africa is like Europe, it's quite easy to be home and still have the fundamentals that are in place in Europe whereas if you go from Burkina Faso or you go from say a Tanzania you know and move to Europe you'll find it a lot better because infrastructure etc um, 
is a lot better in Europe in comparison to them countries. So you do find that you, you have that issue. In terms of nurturing players, all players are different, all personalities are different. Some players won't give you a minute's problem or a minute's hassle and, and some players take 24-7 of your time to manage and that's just the dynamics of different personalities. All your companies, Siavuma, you've grown it massively since, as you say, you arrived in 2009. Where is it going? Where is it at this particular moment? So, the company obviously per se started way back in the mid-2000s in terms of myself in, in the UK. And then when I came to South Africa in 2009, uh, the company was launched on the, on the African continent in South Africa. Um, and we've grown from a one-man, two-man band to where we are today. Our offices are in Cape Town. We have people on the ground in Cape Town, in Johannesburg, uh, full-time in Tanzania, Senegal, uh, Namibia. So we're operating across continent. We've built our network not only across Africa, and we've been at the forefront in terms of doing deals from Africa into South Africa with African players from Africa and South Africa into Europe worldwide. We've, worked, we've done deals in the MLS, we've done deals in the Indian Super League, Azerbaijan, Thailand, all over Vietnam, uh, all over Europe. So we've built our network worldwide and um, we've been working with uh, Bay Soccer for many years. I've been working with Bay Soccer sporadically for many years, even before I came to South Africa. And we took that relationship to the next level, which was a, an official joint venture that we signed with them two years ago. Uh, and that relationship has worked out very well. We, we work predominantly with them. We, we, we work within their network. Uh, we feel part of their, of their company and their network. Um, Base Soccer were taken over by Creative Artist Agency, CAA, which is the biggest in the world in terms of sports marketing and sports sponsorships and they bought out base last year july july uh, 2019 uh, which has now put them on number one in the forbes rich list of uh, sports management companies and um and see is very much a part of and see is part of that that arrangement with bay soccer because we are their kind of eyes and ears in africa and we're working on growing that relationship even more now. We're in discussions to take it to the next level, which is exciting. Um, and it feels very proud to be part of such a, a great um, um, brand, such as BASE and CAA. Um, and that's where we are today. Paul, tell us who are some of the BASE's, BASE CAA's clients? Some of, the big names. Um, some of the big names for Bay CAA would be people like uh, Arsene Wenger, Roy Hodgson, uh, Carlo Ancelotti, uh, in terms of coaches. Um, in terms of players, you're looking at people like Deli Alley, uh, Carl Walker, James Madison, uh, Danny Rose. Danny Rose, now there's one. You've mm. got a story to tell about Danny Rose. Yeah, well, Danny, um, I mean, his mum and dad and his, and his uncles. Um, are very close friends of mine. We grew up together. We're from the same area in England, uh, Doncaster, and we all grew up together. So I literally saw Danny from the day he was born uh, grow up uh, to where he is today. And in his early days of his football, uh, I used to be there watching him a lot at under sort of 12 level and 13 level. And then just before I, I moved to South Africa, I used to do a lot in terms of uh, assisting Danny when he was at Leeds. So uh, getting him from A to B and going to watch his games because his, uh, his agent is, is uh, Mark Rankin, uh, a very close friend of mine. We've grown up for over 45 years together. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's been uh, marvellous to see where Daniel is today and all, all credit to him and to his family. And um, yeah, very proud to see him playing for England and, and achieving what he's achieved, not only for himself, for his family, but also for the town that we grew up in, Doncaster. He's put Doncaster on the map. You just said you've been mates for over 45 years. You look really good for over 60. <laughs> Thanks, Deshi. <laughs> yeah. I'm not as old as you, but I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> yeah, and no, I would know, wouldn't I? Yeah. <laughs> um, Paul, 
there, there's got to be some funny stories in terms of transfers, players, clubs, maybe languages, different miscommunication, misunderstanding. There's got to be a few of those. I think there's a, there's, there's a few stories and a few funny stories. Some, I, I suppose, I can't really um, say on camera. Um, but, um, yeah, we have had our moments over the years. I, 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 I will write a book one day when I'm done um, because I, I think working in Africa is, you know, has been interesting, to say the least. Is a book by itself. And it'll be a book by itself. It might take some time to write it, but it is definitely what I'm going to do. And uh, there will be a chapter Deshi dedicated to yourself <laughs> because we have had some funny stories <laughs> over the years. <laughs> we have. Uh, tell us about your involvement in the Indian Super League. For me, a really special time, one I won't forget. Well, of course, when it was launched, I mean, we were, Sia Vuma Sports Group was taken on by Atletico Madrid to help them with recruitment and especially from Africa. In fact, we took you there, Deshi, as goalkeeping Correct. coach, as you remember. And uh, so it, our involvement was we were predominantly and exclusively working with Atletico Madrid, with Atletico, Atletico de Calcutta. Um, I think we did that for three or four years. I think in the three years you were there, we won the league twice and we, we were runner up, runners up in the other season. Obviously, we represented uh, Antonio uh, Lopez, Habas, who's now gone back there as well, and he's doing very well. Um, look, it was, um, and still is, it's a great league, commercially very good. Um, I think where the disappointing thing for me with the Indian Super League is that in the early days, we got it on Supersport. So we watched all the games live here, and I believe it was quite popular here. Um, but that stopped. So in, in terms of TV coverage, the Indian Super League is not seen in Africa, really. And I think that's something that the the owners of the league or the custodians of the league need to relook at because I think Africa as a continent is very important because not only for their reach in terms of followers but in terms of players going into the Indian Super League. I mean from, from Africa we've had Fikru that went there did very well, Nato from Botswana did very well, Shamik Duty we took there did very well. So the players that we've, we've taken to Atletico de Calcutta, you could argue have been cult heroes and probably been the best players of their time. Fikru absolutely ripped it up when he first went there, as you know. He did. Shamik was outstanding. Um, Nato was stalwart for three years. Um, uh, uh, Sibo Mbata, uh, Sibon Gikeki Mbata, went there for six months with Robbie Keane and had a great partnership with Robbie Keane up front. So... I think all of the players that we've taken there have been exceptional and I think we should get more and more, more players there because it is a, a very good commercial league and uh, it pays well. Uh, the players are well looked after, paid on time. Uh, they live in good, good surroundings, good accommodation. But I think from, from their side, from the Indian side, I think the, like I say, the custodians need to look at how can they get the, the TV rights, how can we get it back onto super sport especially super sport because dstv ultimately is the the biggest in africa yeah um, i must agree with you i think for me the most striking feature was the development in two or three years of the indian game <clears throat> and i think players benefited from the european uh, uh, players as well learned a hell of a lot and and uh, let me tell you i've often said in the next five, ten years, um, India, if they keep going this way, uh, they're going to go a long way. But they, knew, they do need to get their football exposed, particularly in Africa. Yeah, they need to get it exposed. Um, I think, if I'm not mistakenly, I think Man City now has gone into Mumbai. Um, I think they've, they've bought into Mumbai. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, Atletico pulled out. Um, and I think the more they get global interaction, more they get buy-in from European clubs um, to try and help them develop the game, the better. Um, like I say, from a commercial sense, I think they need to look at the TV rights again. I think that was a major problem after the third season when it just totally dropped off from Africa. You're losing a whole continent. Um, 
But in terms of the, the infrastructure, the way the league was, it was great, exciting. I mean, you remember being there playing in front of 60,000. Just the product on TV alone yeah. was, was fantastic. Um, I haven't, to be honest, seen it on TV for some time because obviously it's not here. Um, but I think there's a lot of uh, expansion to be done. And yeah. if, if the league continues to grow in that way, then ultimately... You know, their players can only improve with playing with better players around them. Also, European and global coaches go in there as well uh, to help them. I mean, just in the, the goalkeepers you work for over three years, you know, you saw the massive improvement from the goalkeeper you took from day one to where he was after the second or third year playing national team football and becoming a totally different goalkeeper to when he started. Yeah. Um, also, it was the... The, the other goalkeepers as well. I mean, we had a goalkeeper from PSG, uh, Adele Bethe, and then one of the top goalkeepers in Europe, uh, Kalata Yu. Um, so I think all of that helped as well. But if I may say, we're looking at getting some uh, footage from the Indian Super League, and, uh, and hopefully that will come through, and if it does, We'll have a little insert on it in the future. Look, I think I think what the Indian Super League could possibly do to a degree is follow the model of La Liga, Correct. or even the Bundesliga to a degree. Albeit, you know, La Liga and Bundesliga worldwide are more popular. But you know, as La Liga have done, they've set up an office in Johannesburg, an office in Nigeria. You know, Bundesliga have done the same. Um, offices around the world for both La Liga and Bundesliga. And I think the Indian Super League, probably not on the same scale, but should look at something like that. And I think Africa for the Indian Super League yeah. is definitely a continent where they can do more. And I think for a brand and from a marketing perspective, I think there's a lot to be gained for them to look at Africa. Um, and as a company, we'd be happy to assist them in any way we could in terms of trying to promote the Indian Super League within the African continent. I, I've also got to say, and um, I've got the greatest respect for the Spanish. Having worked with them, the work ethic, and I now understand uh, why the quality of their, their football is where it is. It's, uh, their work ethic is just absolutely unbelievable. Uh, I was very sad to see Atletico Madrid pull out of Atletico de Kolkata. Um, I think, um, I think they may have learned that uh, that wasn't the route to go, where they finished bottom of the league when the Spanish pulled up. Um, and uh, they've now got a Spanish coach again, and they top of the league. I think um, from an Atletico de Madrid uh, point of view, when they entered into India, it was, it was from a commercial uh, entity uh, that they were looking at. So their, their relationship was they, they were involved with Atletico de Calcutta from a technical point of view. So if you remember, it was technical people from Madrid that did the recruitment, that helped the Indians to put uh, processes in place from a technical aspect. And I think from a commercial aspect, um, they were looking at obviously sponsorship deals in terms of from the Indian market and from the Asian market for Atletico Madrid, which, you know, they did do some commercial um, or build some commercial relationships from India. Look, I think when they pulled out, they pulled out for various reasons. Um, they went into Mexico very heavily because the Mexican league has become very big. If I'm stand to be corrected, but I think they've, they bought a club in the second division and they've now gone to the top division. Um, I read recently that they'd, they'd bought, uh, Madrid have just bought a franchise in another country in the world. I just can't put the, the name of that country where it is. Uh, but they're moving into to other countries. So I think from, from Madrid's point of view, they did a lot of great work in yeah. India. And I think what they did is they laid the foundations for Atletico de Calcutta to build on. And I think quite rightly, as you've said, is that after the first year when they found themselves at the bottom and stuff like that, they've now reverted to Antonio Lopez, who was a fantastic coach, Spanish, um, you know, the work ethic, the methodical planning, yeah. the professionalism he demonstrates with his technical team is second to none. 
you know. And we've seen that in South Africa when he was at Sundowns, came to bid Vitz for a short spell. I think Antonio Lopez was a was a coach we lost. In all yeah. honesty, from South Africa, yeah, I think if we were if we would have been able to keep somebody like Antonio within the the makings of South African football, it would he would have he would have helped our brands grow, you know, along with Pizzo Masamani who's done wonderful things, um, Gavin Hunt, uh, Ernst Middendorp. I mean, these are quality coaches, and then along with the young ones coming through like Rilani and you know um, Fadlu. Um, if you bring the young coaches and then our senior coaches here, and then you give, you know, influx from outside and people work together, it only bodes well for for the future of South African football. Right, Paul, uh, you've just been involved in a window now. How does that go and where do you see it going in the future? Are there any sort of players coming through, big name players? Yeah, I mean, look, January window generally is always, I would say, kind of quiet. You don't always do the bulk of your business in January. In terms of South Africa, we've brought um, a player, Ethan Sampson, back from, from America. He's gone to Barocca. He's a South African boy that left these shores when he was very young from the ASD Academy and went to the MLS. Came back for a short spell with Ubuntu and went back to America. So he's just had two years in America and we brought him to, to Barocca, a club that we have a good working relationship with. And we brought Dylan Kerr, uh, the coach uh, from England, who was the previous coach of Black Leopards and unfortunately had to resign due to his, his mum who was seriously ill and, and subsequently died. And Dylan had to resign from Black Leopards having kept them in the league to go and nurse his mum, uh, Gloria Jean, may she rest in peace. Um, so Dylan's now back with Barocca. He's got a mandate to, to keep them in the league. Fantastic club in terms of infrastructure. The owner of Barocca has really done great things in terms of trying to, you know, give his community a, a, a first class club. He's got a new training ground there that is modelling on kind of Naturina of Kaiser Chiefs and, and Sundowns. Um, he's trying to put a squad together. Uh, to, 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 to compete in that top six. And I think bringing a, a, a coach on of, Dilla, uh, of Dylan's calibre, not only within the, the workings of, of fantastic man management, but Dylan is very experienced in the workings of a club. And I think if that relationship is allowed to grow together, I think between the chairman and, and Dylan, they can, they, can do, they can achieve some good things. Can I just tell you a funny story with Dylan? So a couple of years ago, I go to, to the English FA to do a goalkeeping course. And um, Dylan worked around the corner at Burton Albion. And so he pops around <laughs> um, to come visit, which he always does. Um, Dylan and I incidentally go back many, many years. We played together. Um, but he popped around and it so happens that we were in this lecture about goalkeeping and uh, how goalkeepers support defenders. And the lecturer was talking about a game that involved Swindon Town. And uh, Dylan, who sat there right next to me, <laughs> he got involved in this whole discussion because he was at that game. And he noticed that the one goalkeeper played completely differently, played much higher up. And uh, it was clear to see, you know, and, and the lecturer asked him to stand up and he spoke to everybody, <laughs> which Dylan would normally do. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, Dylan, Dylan uh, as a Yorkshireman like myself, he can talk, can Dylan? But uh, yeah, no, Dylan's got, uh, he's a fantastic coach. He's got, he's got great experience, I mean, he originally played in South Africa with you when he was 18. Went back and played for Sheffield Wednesday and, and, the, and the famous Leeds United who uh, I used to watch Dylan on the terraces when he played with the likes of, you know, um, Vinnie Jones, Gordon Strachan, yeah. Tony DiRigo. I mean, what a team that was at Leeds United in them days. And then when he came back to assist Sammy Trotton at Black Aces is when I first came to South Africa and Dylan and I started working together and I took Dylan to Vietnam. Um, in the early days, he went as technical director. 
Then he was assistant coach. He worked for the Vietnamese uh, national team as well, as one of the assistants in the uh, Asian Games, the Suzuki Cup, which is a big tournament. And then he, um, and then he went head coach um, for a, a club that had never won anything, and he won the FA Cup for them. And that was also a funny story, Desh, is that I'll tell you is that you know one of the le hard lessons that Dylan has learnt over the years is when you're working in different cultures, you have to try where possible to work within that culture and try not to be the Englishman abroad. Uh, when he first went to Vietnam, I got a phone call after about six weeks and it was Dylan Hospital, Dylan Hospital. And that's all, you know, I could understand because of the English. Couldn't get to the life of me why, and Dylan was, was ser in a seriously bad way in hospital. Um, and the story went that he'd fallen off his motorbike on the way home. Yeah. It was only subsequently a year later that I obviously found out that he hadn't fallen off his motorbike. He'd actually touched the wrong bottom in an ice club, innocently. And uh, when he came out the, 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 the nightclub, um, the local Vietnamese mafia just wanted a quiet word with Dylan <laughs> and put him in hospital. That was a funny story because he always denied it. And the other funny story was when he won the FA Cup in Vietnam, yeah. A bit, little bit like South Africa, they have certain cultures and certain almost superstitions. And one of the things you don't do in Vietnam is treat the cup with, in their eyes, content. You know, you don't, like we do in England, put the top of the cup on your, on your head on the open top bus and you drink beer out of it. Well, Dylan was going around with this cup and he actually slept with the FA Cup in his hotel bed for the night with his arm around it. And they took pictures of it. And the next day I got a phone call to say, Dylan not doing good with cup. Dylan not doing good with cup. And I couldn't understand it. And they showed me these photographs and it was Dylan in bed, asleep in the morning with, the, with his arm around the cup. So he, he's learned his lesson over the years. But listen, that's part of working in, in different countries. You've got to understand the cultures. And he's worked in Vietnam, he did very well. He's worked in Tanzania, did very well. Worked in Kenya, won the league twice. You know, brilliant guy, brilliant coach, and uh, you've played with him, Deshi, yeah. so you know. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'm a little bit biased, but uh, I think we've, I've, I've we're already all... assured people that yeah. the rocker won't go anyway. Yeah, well, hopefully that'll be the case, but we are a little bit biased, but he's a, he's a good coach and he's a, he's, a, he's a good man. Right, Paul, so that's the, the recent window. Uh, the future window coming up in July, what do you see happening there? Well, obviously, it's a big year because obviously, in terms of clients that we may look to get to Europe, um, we've got the Olympic Games, Deshi, coming in July, which, you know, all credit to David Natwani and his team and to Safa and the boys for qualifying. Unbelievable to qualify, given the dynamics of the time of the AFCON. Uh, we go to the Olympics for the second time. We went in 2016. So, yeah, I mean, in terms of the Olympics um, squad as a company, SSG, we expect to have uh, uh, a good number or a few uh, players in that squad. And, uh, yeah, in terms of players that we, we may look to get to Europe, I mean, we don't always like to disclose names and what we're working on, but uh, most definitely, I think, with the way that Reef Rosler has performed uh, for Kaiser Chiefs, We've always had the big uh, aspirations of getting Reef to Europe, and I think this year could be a year that uh, we could find Reef uh, with a big interest from Europe. So that would be one. Um, in terms of taking that on to the next year, 18 months, you've also got an AFCON coming in early 21, AFCON 2020. You've got a World Cup uh, coming as well, under 20. So in 2021, you've got the under-20 AFCON and the under-20 World Cup. I think we've got a great squad at under-20 level. I expect we will go to AFCON and hopefully qualify for a under-20 World Cup. And then obviously, CAF have now announced that they've moved the AFCON 2021, which is now going to be in January next year. So a year from now, we'll be sitting in an AFCON and hopefully we'll qualify for the AFCON. And... Um, you know, we've got South African players that uh, 
that's a great stage for them. So if we can be at AFCON 2021, it's fantastic for all South African boys that are going to be involved in Bafana Bafana to showcase their talents and get themselves in a position to maybe get to, to Europe. Realistically, Paul, um, how difficult is it going to be to qualify if you consider our recent history? Qualifying for these F Well, I think, uh, I think we will qualify. I think Malefi has done a good job so far. I think we've got a fantastic squad. I think we've got great players coming now from the under-23s into that squad. Obviously, the focus has been on the Olympics, so Malefi's had to allow the Olympic squad to work together before he can then start picking. But I think now in March, I think you're going to see younger players from that Olympic squad, etc., coming into the Bafana squad. And then once the Olympics is out of the way, I think you'll see, I think you'll see quite a lot of change in Bafana Bafana. Um, we've got a lot of young players coming through. Uh, these players need to be in Bafana. They've got the level to be in Bafana now. So I think it's exciting times for, for Bafana Bafana. Um, and I think with the coach that we've got in place, and he's got the support of PSL coaches, we will, we will qualify for the AFCON. And I'm also quite confident we can qualify for the World Cup 2022. So Paul, exciting times, a lot of hard work uh, coming up for you. Yeah, there is. I mean, it's all, always ever-changing. The industry is ever-changing. The way we do things is ever-changing. We're always governed with the change in rules. Um, from a business perspective, you know, with our relationship with Bay CAA, we've done a lot of work on the commercial front in terms of activations and sp sponsorships. We've been working very heavily on the Africa Fives uh, campaign, which is with the uh, Castle Lager it originally started with. We've now gone into calling it Africa Fives because we're taking in, I think this year we're going into 16, 18 countries in Africa with the African Fives, Five Aside campaign um, under the AB and Bev brewery, uh, which is the biggest brewery in the world. Um, that campaign, as you know, Deshi is a Five Aside tournament around different countries in Africa, which uh, accumulates in terms of the African finals and then the winner of the African finals wins the prize, which uh, the prize last year was a trip to see the Barcelona Madrid derby with Samuel Eto'o. And uh, we've represented Samuel Eto'o on the campaign for the last three years. We're in our third year now and we're, we're looking to go into the next two years. We're going into countries like Nigeria, Ghana, um, Cameroon, uh, and it's exciting times and the African Fives brand, the African Fives campaign has grown beyond belief. And we're looking to take that even heavier into Africa and into global because the idea is, can we take this campaign globally? Can we take this campaign into a World Cup of five-a-side football under the AB and Bev brands? Because they've got brands in every continent, in every country in the world, so to speak. So. The idea is to crack it in Africa, then we take it global. So that's been fantastic to be able to work with a legend like Samuel Eto'o for the last two years. For me personally, has been inspirational and has been an honor. He's a fantastic guy and a fantastic person to work with. We've certainly learned a lot, but that whole commercial space is a, net, is a space that SSG, along with the backing of our partners in Europe of Bay CAA, we're looking to grow further. Paul, I tell you what, certainly very exciting times ahead for you. Mm. But let me just thank you for spending some time with us, all the information you've given us, and uh, some of the funny stories you've told us. Thank you. Cheers.